Are your house plants getting on your nerves? Are you annoyed that you got this plant and like a year later now, it's still not doing very much? Stick with me whilst we go for plant roast number two. Hi there, my name is Memo, this is my channel, House Planty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me, it's tropical houseplants. So today it's going to be another video that might not be so positive. <laughs> this is video two of my plant roast. I heard all of you that just went, you missed this and you missed this and you missed this and you missed this and most of you were entirely right. I missed way too many plants from that video so this might become a bit of a series. Oh, such a negative series. But I think it's helped all of us vent and clear clear the air about some of the plants who were just like, Ugh, this is just annoying me now. So as I said, plant roast number two. And without further ado, let's dive into the first one. <laughs> this is probably going to surprise some of you the same way that the Gloriosum surprised loads of you on my previous video. And I did hear you, yes, I do, <laughs> I do know the irony of both me and Kaylee Ellen pretty much bring out those videos within a week or two of each other. And she named the Gloriosum her number one plant. And I was just like, eh, maybe not. <laughs> but that again, differing opinions, basically. And I've still got my Gloriosum, got two of my Gloriosums, and they're still growing in my condition. I've still got them. Uh, for how much longer? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> different strokes for different folks. I think it's the expression, it might be wrong. I'm one of those weird foreign people whose English isn't their first language. So I, sometimes I take like sayings and idioms and make them my own, basically. So if you ever see them on my video, <laughs> Don't judge too harshly. <laughs> but yes, the, the plant that I want to talk about is the one that you might be able to see behind me here. And I will see about adding clips in because I ain't moving that because it's also growing behind my shelf there. But it is the Philodendron Melanochrysum. And I think the reason why I absolutely had, I agree with a lot of you that had issues with this plant, but one person in that original video, and I cannot remember who it was, if you watched this video, please give us a shout down below in the comments. When the melanochrysum goes into a melanochrysis, and I'm just like, yes, that is such a good saying, and you need to trademark that, because that's so true. <laughs> this is a plant, and I, I will say why I'm adding it onto the plant roast. I'll be honest, it's not a plant that I was truly desperate to have. I know a lot of people want it and a lot of people want these kind of velvety type leaves and it is a velvety type philodendron. I'm not going to kind of take that away from you. It's very similar to the Queen Anthurium. It's that kind of velvetiness that a lot of people die for. Yes, but if you get a really small one, I found from both my experience and a lot of other people have said, you've kind of got a glorified micans and it takes a while for the leaves to start sizing up. Yes, Sydney plant guy goes on to talk about moss poles and I think <laughs> very controversial video that I did on my views on moss poles and I'll link it at the top there uh, but this is definitely one that I think does benefit from something like that to follow the method that Sydney plant guy does which is kind of let it grow into the moss pole then chop it and keep going and then you will get those massive massive leaves that everybody's looking for because essentially with the melanochrysum Everybody's after big, long, strappy leaves that are velvety. Yes. Now, I can only talk from my experience. It's very temperamental on its watering, basically. You need to get the watering just right. If you don't, it will let you know very quickly with yellowing leaves, whether it's too dry or too wet. Yes, on this one. Wowee, the, the spider mites of it all and the mealy bugs of it all. I don't think I've ever had thrips on it, but it needs slightly darker conditions, which could be a good thing. But again, with this one, if you give it too dark of a condition, it won't grow large enough or fast enough. And if you give it too bright conditions, then you'll get what I get, which is slight yellowing on the leaves and slight bleaching. I don't know whether or not that's coming up on the camera. If not, I will add an image on the side there. But yeah, for how much fuss this plant needs, I truly don't know if it's worth it after growing it for as long as I have. It's still a pretty plant. Interestingly, the longest leaves and the best quality leaves are right behind the shelf. But it has 
thrown out quite a few aerial roots, I might then chop that up and propagate it. And the mother plant, I don't know, somebody, somebody might get it donated to them because I know a lot of people might want it. And it's been a plant that's been growing for a while. Has it sized up drastically in the years that I've had it? No. So, but I do know that you can get them to be quite sizable. The other thing and another reason, probably a bit of a sensitive topic that I wanted to include this onto this list is I, again, I am assuming here, I do not know, this is just assumption. This is a plant that to me worried me a bit when it first came on the market and people were getting massive plants of it with massively mature leaves when nobody had really ever heard of it before. And I'm just sitting there going, knowing what I know now about how slow this plant can be to get to that, even following a faster method like Sydney Plant Guide, it does take a while to get it to that established stage. How many of those very mature plants on the on the get-go, basically when people were buying, were potentially poached from nature, basically? Because it's not as if the growers would have had any indication that their people were going to really fall in love with this plant and its mature form. So why would they have been growing it, basically, to that size as well? So, mm, <laughs> and I do know that the Melanochrysum was a plant that was vaguely popular in the 70s as well, but it was grown more like a micans than it was kind of in its upright form and kind of for the mature leaves, because back then it would have made more sense for it to be a trailing plant. So yeah, for me, it's just not worth the hype, not for how much drama comes with it, basically. It's okay, and it's, I've still got it in my collection. Does it set my world on fire? No. And I, I am fully aware, and I started strong with this one, I am fully aware that there people are going to fight me in the comments with this. But again, this is my opinion, basically. Hopefully, based on some of your comments from the previous video, I think some of your opinions as well. <laughs> uh -huh. And moving on to Escondapsus now. You might notice through this video that some of these are just going to be images of plants that I used to own because I no longer own some of these plants. This would be one of them. This is Escondapsus trebui moonlight. There is also a dark form of this plant, which I have never owned. Interestingly, when I got the moonlight, I originally wanted the dark form. <laughs> Having seen a few people, I think I did a video on it as well. I'll add the, the link to the video. I think it might have even been a review. I spoke to a few people that had got the dark form and the moonlight. And they're just like, if you think the moonlight is slow, do not bother getting the dark form because that grows even slower. So. All right, let me give you my thoughts, my filtered thoughts on this plant. So when it first came onto the market in Europe, same as my one, and this wasn't the plant necessarily, but this was the only one that we were able to get in mass over here. They were all massively overwatered from the growers, probably in the Netherlands. That was a bit of a mistake, I think, at that point, because they worried that they might ship badly. But pretty much in pure cocoa coir, pretty much everybody's plants, at least the first batch that came out at that point, was all rotted out basically. So, and considering how slow this plant is to both root and grow, you were starting off on a negative foot straight away. So I had a friend back then who had just got it. I was already on my second one because the first one had died a death because of root rot, regardless of everything that I tried to do to salvage it. And I was doing the thing that everybody was just like, don't, don't repot it as soon as you got it. But uh, that plant did not dry out for a month and a half. Basically, it was still sapping wet. So that tells you something. Basically, the roots were already gone pretty much before I got it. But because it's so slow growing, it took a while for it to show the fact that it was pretty much dead in the in the in the in the boggy soil. Again, not the plant's fault, but super super slow growing. Don't get me wrong; it is a beautiful plant in terms of its foliage. Huge pest magnet, thrips, mealybugs, spider mites. Everything attacked this plant, and everything got to the point where we would attack it. It would attack it fast, at least in my experience, which would mean that half of the foliage would be lost. And again, coming on to the fact that this is a slow growing plant, <laughs> it kind of felt like a never ending battle or something that looked diseased most of the time, basically, because of the pest, not because of the way that the plant was growing. I did manage to get mine to grow quite large. And in that original video that I was talking about, people were commenting and they're just like, how have you got yours to grow it? I'm just I didn't realize that I managed to do something noteworthy. But it still didn't look great. It was scraggly. Should I have maybe grown it up a pole? Probably. I know some people, I think Nick Pelleggi um, on his channel had got it and 
was growing and it was multiple ones and it was a bit more of a mature one, I would say if you're going to get it, go for a more of a mature one. Do not go for a single leaf cutting or anything else. You will be there for years. Still not as slow <laughs> as the philodendron lupinum, but it, it's a plant that I just kind of like. And I think me and a lot of other people fell out of love with it relatively quickly. There was a lot of things that it just wasn't ticking off. Again, my experiences for this video, and this is why this is my plant roast. <laughs> uh, the next one, I have got a... I got this recently, and I'm surprised at myself for getting this recently because... <laughs> and this was another firm favorite of people who were just like, why did you not include that pink princess? <laughs> this is actually a pink princess that has got some pink on it. My original pink princess, which again, I think I did a review somewhere and I, I think I scored it badly even back then. It's the brown or the caca princess, basically. There was very little actual pink propagation, propagation, pink variegation that was happening on the leaves. You still got the random like Cinderella foot thing where the leaf would slightly come out of the caterpillar and it will get stuck. And I have never experienced any other plant that's anywhere near as bad as the pink princess for that, where you get the leaves just getting stuck all the time and people trying to get them out and then it rips and invariably the leaf that will rip is the one that actually had any glimpse of the pink on it. Every single other leaf that comes out like a weird caca color, again, bad example because I bought this because this was a fiber. This was five pounds and it had more variegation than my original plant ever did. And it's seeming to want to keep its variegation. And the reality with this is a lot of people got into this, a lot of people wanted it and a lot of people got kind of what I would class as second class cuttings rooted out or cuttings that didn't have an awful lot of irrigation. So there wasn't any real decent variegated genetics in the plants we were all getting. We were all buying them on the hope that, you know what, one day I might get pink variegated leaf. And you're sitting there two years later, three years later, and you've got a splash of pink on two leaves on a 50 leaf plant, basically. And everything else just looks a bit muddy and ruddy, basically. <laughs> People will just say, oh, just hold off, and you will. And the variegation, you might not be seeing it on the stem, but you will see it eventually pop out. And yeah, occasionally you did. Mm. I think I probably speak for a lot of people that just went, this was the ultimate catfish off of the house plant, where people were just like, mm, this is not what I bought into. I wanted splashes of pink, and I got a caca colored plant that doesn't matter how much I propagated it. It's interesting because when you cut it, and I think there was a sick, twisted pleasure that people got <laughs> with this plant because they were so annoyed with it, that when you do cut it to take a cutting, it kind of, the, the sap is like blood red. So you're just like, oh, this is, I'm actually harming this plant. It's bleeding for its sins. But, so maybe that went a bit dark there. <laughs> but yeah, with this, uh, ultimate catfish it just wasn't worth it and as i said i got this i've still bought another one because i'm just like you know what if i can keep it to have some random splashes of pink great if i could talk to myself back then when i, I didn't spend that much money on it because i wasn't desperate to get one but i still spent a decent chunk of money i think it was low double digits towards mid double digits I would have just said, you know what, don't waste your money, get something else. I also wasn't one that necessarily needed that kind of pink on a leaf. And to be fair, there are much better plants that have come out or people are more aware of that have got pink on their foliage, which are a ton better and easier and just, you don't end up with a brown princess, basically. So I can't believe I missed this from a previous plant roast. This is, this is, this is a plant that really like drove a lot of people insane, but yes. <laughs> think the pink princess deserve its place on my plant roast. Coming into another philodendron, which again was around the same time as the pink princess. I do not have this anymore, so I will add a picture here. Mine grew okay in the beginning. <laughs> the philodendron birkin. And I think I've done a video on that, and I will link that as well. And there's a lot of people that were interested in the birkin even back then when I was giving my review with it. But... <sighs> Do I have strong opinions about the Birkin to the same level as the Pink Princess? No. Nope. Do I, again, looking back on it now, do I think it was worth it? No. Was it ever worth that kind of money? No. 
Is it worth the five odd pounds now that you might see it in a shop? Yeah, fair enough. And people can get it and they'll see how it kind of go, goes for them. But it was it was those leaves that were striped with the white and the green. And it was an interesting variegation that nobody had seen before. Ultimate plant where people lost a lot of money on because they bought it for a lot of money when it first came out thinking, oh, I can propagate it and get maybe a quick buck. And it, I have not seen so many plants plummet in price quite so it literally fell off a cliff edge because it went from three figures at the very very beginning to single figures within about three or four months basically so <laughs> people and people that have been here for a while probably saw a lot of philodendron birkins being given as giveaway plants because at some point people were just like we just need to get these off the shelf at this particular moment in time because we're not going to make a profit and people might still find these interesting there you go did it grow okay? Yes. Did it grow slow? Also yes. Did it have any particular idiosyncrasies? No, it was a philodendron. It, it Arguably, possibly one of the slowest philodendrons that I've grown. Yes. Does it get, did mine, and I think a lot of other people's from what the comments were being made, did it get to a certain stage and then start growing really funky, basically? So, it, the, the stem might twist to one side and then it, the leaves might get a bit smaller and maybe it was just mine or a few other people ones and there was something wrong with ours. I don't know. Maybe the cheaper ones, now that they've had more time to come onto the market, have been better. Was it that we got a lot of philodendron birkins all of a sudden because there was a rush towards tissue culturing them and we all got slightly below par genetically bad birkins? Possibly, basically. But for what it was... I don't know. It's it, it was the ultimate kind of philodendron that was giving strong peperomia vibes, basically, for me. Because I don't think, and I haven't done a, a search recently to see if there's anybody who's grown a philodendron birkin to a mature size. Like, would it be really interesting to see a birkin leaf that was like a meter wide and long with those stripes and see if it kept it or if it changed in shape? Yes, 100%. But I don't think there was anything there at that point probably because it's so slow or does it ever get to that level because it does feel to me that it's one of those philodendrons that always stayed about the same size and about the size of a peperomia and it didn't really particularly grow too whole might be one that a lot of people like and again i think this might be one that surprises me and a lot of people might give me a lot of grief in this video again my opinions but i i don't know is there still a lot of love for the birkin out there are people still into it for me, it was a plant that didn't stay in my collection for longer than a year because I personally lost interest in it way too quickly. It was just a bit like, oh, okay. The, the leaves all look the same. Like it, The novelty factor of the way that the variegation appears on the leaf went away really quickly, basically. It didn't keep an interest in any way or form for me. And I think maybe it's because it was so formulaic. I think the difference with more traditionally variegated plants is that you get splotchiness here, or you get a half moon here, or you get like speckling here. Like every new leaf is a bit more exciting because you're just like, oh, what's this one going to look like with the Birkin? Oh, it's another stripy variegated leaf. Um, I think there was a few people that were getting like reverted leaves towards green that was causing them issues. Again, again, it piles onto the point where I'm just like, Birkin for me. Another one that might be a bit controversial. And I will... <laughs> This is a this is a, a soft roast for this because this is an entire genus for me. Hoyas, Hoya heads. Before you come to me, listen, 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 listen to what I'm going to say. Basically, I still love all of my hoyas. Basically, however, and this is something that I'm seeing happen more and more and more, and especially for the people that are growing hoyas in regular household conditions, even people that are growing hoyas amongst other plants. They are loved, beloved by mealybugs, at least in my experience, and a lot of other people's experience. I think there's also something that's coming up on people's awareness now with like flat mites. Um, yeah, like Hoyas are great. Do not get me wrong. There's a lot of benefits to the Hoyas and the blooms and everything, and that's different leaf structures and all these things. I am not taking away from that. I just want to take a moment to roast the fact that it's possibly one of the most pest prone plants genuses that I have basically like almost every single one of my Hoyas has 
either got mealybugs or had a mealybug infestation at any given time, to the point that with a lot of my Hoyas, I just treat them, spray them down with water or treat them with uh, rubbing alcohol once every month for the ones that have got loads of them and they always have them all the time, or once every three months for most of my other ones. And it is just a bit frustrating, basically. We still all enjoy growing Hoyas, but there's also a large number of people that I'm speaking to online that mealybugs eke them out. And I kind of get it. They're a bit icky, basically, because of the fluffiness and because of the stickiness and all of these things. I get it. But and I also know a lot of people that used to have large Hoya collections and just the constant mealybug issue just put them off it, basically. And I think a lot of them were having mealybugs issues and then flat mites kind of came onto the scene and they kind of noticed that some of them were having flat mite issues and they were just like, this is just not worth it, basically. Again, because you get the slight challenge with Hoyas, because they're a slightly more slower growing houseplant, if you get a severe infestation on a Hoya, you might lose a third of the plant, which has taken you a year or a year and a half to maybe even two years to get with some of these Hoyas. And it's disheartening. It is. I mean, there's no two ways around it. Like it takes a plant that takes a long time to grow and you're finally proud of something. And then overnight it gets pests and you lose some of your plant, especially if you haven't noticed it. So it's always a good idea to kind of be eagle-eyed around your Hoyas. But yeah, Hoyas, beautiful pests on Hoyas, pain in the bum. And I'm going to finish. I, I don't think I had a single Calathea on my original plant rose. <laughs> I'm about to rectify that. I could add a lot of Calatheas into this, but I will put the poster childs of everybody's stress when it came to Calatheas. The Calathea pinstripe. I think it's Calathea pinstripe. I think, is it the ornata? No, it's not the ornata. I cannot remember basically, but I will add it here and I'll add the botanical name at the top there. <laughs> Calatheas generally, but this specific Calathea, because it's one that a lot of people, when they're first getting into plants, really want to get it. They like the look of it. They like the pink pinstripes on it and all these things. By far, in my experience, and a lot of your experience is based on several years worth of comments on both Instagram and YouTube, one of the most challenging Calatheas to grow. At any given point, it is infested with spider mites. It is going crispy-leaved. It's dying off. Or, best case scenario for a lot of people, it's looking half dead for a few years or a few months, basically. And it's never really like what you first got it from the store or wherever you would have potentially picked it up from. The thing I will say about that, if you are feeling particularly bowler and you've got loads of money to, to kind of keep replacing, treat a Calathea pinstripe as cut flowers. Get it, enjoy it whilst it looks pristine after it's come from the plant nursery for about a month probably before it starts showing problems. And then get another one. Basically, compost it. It's not environmentally friendly. I will say that now before anybody comes for me. But if you really desperately want that plant, that, I think that's the only realistic way you're going to have it without having a whole host of issues, basically. I, there is still something that grates my nerves with the fact that the Calatheas generally are being sold to the wide audience. And everybody is just like, oh, they're common house plants because I can get them everywhere. It must mean they're easy. Show of hands, how many people when they first started off got a Calathea because they found it available and they're just like, this must be easy because they're selling this right next to the pothos. I will get this plant. And Calathea regrets happen to a lot of people afterwards. But do not get me wrong, these plants are beautiful, but they do need relatively specific conditions, which the average person, if they're only going to buy a plant to have one or two plants in their house, this is the type of plant, Calatheas generally, or prayer plants, not all prayer plants, but... They are more challenging, and I have seen so many of my friends who are not into plants start off with those plants because they love the looks and feels. As I said, the pinstripe one is a poster child, but I am talking about most of them at this point. And I know there's exceptions. There's always going to be exceptions. There's like the Ramanthi Trio Star, which is slightly easier. It's still got some of these issues. And you've got the Ornata. The Ornata can have issues as well. I did a whole video on what I found was good care for my Calatheas, and it does still hold true a lot of the time. But it is a plant that they're going to need to fuss over a lot of the times. I know some people have had good success with actually going the opposite route and not fussing over it entirely, which is great, but that's not the case for a lot of people. So 
they're going to need to fuss for a plant that they probably don't. They just bought a plant so it can look pretty in their space with minimal maintenance. That is not the plant to do that with. The same thing is they get something and invariably I think the psychology behind it is I might get a bothos because I know that it's going to grow quite nicely, but I will get a calathea. And this is my this is my favorite. This is my 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 best child because it looks so pretty and a pothos is a pothos. Everybody who's ever had a pothos will know that it's just a pothos, basically. So they put their hopes and dreams on the fussy diva of a plant and invariably when that perishes, it knocks their self-esteem in themselves in terms of growing plants. So even though the pothos, they've kept it alive, which is truly a relatively easy plant to grow and relatively hardcore, They've gone for a diva of a plant that's been sold to them as an easy care plant or it's massively available. And they're just like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm obviously not good. I don't have a green thumb. I'm just like, no, no, no. You killed a calathea as well as most of us out there have killed a calathea at some point. Welcome to the club. If anything, it means you have got the sticking power and you tried to make it work like the rest of us. <laughs> but yeah, I think I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up on the calathea of it all. I think that's a good place to end this video. Did any of these surprise you? <laughs> How much are you all going to hate me in the comments? I dread to think. But uh, yeah, I am happy to make this into a bit more of a series. It's not very often that I can sit and kind of itch a bit on these videos and just kind of vent my issues. And for a lot of these plots, I'm still growing the Melanocrysum here, basically. Like I'm still, I've got a new pink princess that's on the table in front of me. I've still got a few Calatheids pinch salt with all of these things but it's nice to vent your frustrations <laughs> so please do so down below and like you did with the previous video if i've missed any out especially i will do a video about plants that i have owned because i can talk from a point of i've owned this and i agree with you this is this is annoying but add some of your suggestions down below and they might be featured in the next video especially if i've owned or cared for them at some point i will quite happily add them in the next video but yeah Hopefully you've all enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon. I haven't put you up. <laughs> it's the second plant roast. And I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.